Hey, hon, what are you doing? Oh, hey, babe, I just got this new huge enclosure in, so I'm thinking about making it a bioactive setup for a baby carpondro. <laughs> All right, come on. You don't really hate carpondros that much, do you? Well, you know what it is? It's just a terrible combination. You know, you bring a green tree python to a carpet python. It's like, I don't know, J-Lo and Ben Affleck getting engaged for the 37th time. But anyway, you know what? I'm glad you asked that question because every time we shoot a video, we get the same 8 to 10 random questions. So I thought in today's video, we would go through and just answer all those questions and, and give people definitive answers. And I really think it would help a lot of our viewers. Okay, but you still didn't really answer my question. Do I really hate carpondros? Well, let's put it this way. If I was driving and on the side of the road, I saw an injured carpondro breeder, I would definitely help. Okay, good. So like you'd call the police or the ambulance. Oh, no, I would run them over. I put them out of their misery. Welcome to video number 35, everybody. And as always, I'm really excited to be here, and I can't wait to get into today's video. The first thing I want to ask you guys to do, though, is US Arc just put out its own YouTube channel. Garrett Hartle and uh, his team over at Reach Out Reptiles are instrumental in making that happen. So if you guys can please do me that favor, go to the uh, US Arc uh, channel on YouTube. I will put a link on the bottom of this video and you can subscribe to that. That would be a tremendous help. I'd really appreciate it if it's great for US Arc. Um, I also wanted to mention really quickly for you guys who watch my videos regularly, you know that's a discus tank I just got in. I'll be setting that up over the next couple of months. A baby carpondros not going in there. No animals are harmed in the making of this video, so you're totally fine. And we're also going to do a product spotlight uh, in today's video. There's a brand new product out there. It's made by David Brahms. It's Specialty Enclosure Designs. I absolutely love it. It is so much needed in the hobby. It's for folks out there who are only keeping one baby arboreal, whether it's a baby emerald tree boa or a baby green tree python, and you only need uh, you know, one tub as opposed to buying a whole rack. David came up with an amazing solution that's really uh, fairly priced, and it's ready to plug and play, so I can't wait to get into that in today's video. And lastly, I'm going to answer all of your questions out there. Every time we make a video, there's like the same, I'd say, seven to eight questions, really random questions from like, hey, how big does a female green tree python need to be to breed? Or um, where do I put my probe in my incubator? Things along those lines. So I'm going to give you guys you know, definitive, concise answers so you have a clear path. And I think many of you are going to find it uh, really helpful. So why don't we uh, just jump right now into today's product spotlight. So you just went out and you bought yourself a new animal tree boa or you bought yourself a baby green tree python. You don't want a rack because you only have one animal. Um, and it's a costly to buy an entire rack too. So my friend David Brahms over at Specialty Enclosure Designs came up with a great idea. If that name sounds familiar because I think in every video I pretty much mention David Brahms and Specialty Enclosure Designs because he makes all of my purchase and he does an amazing job. And just a reminder to everybody out there, I don't get paid sponsorships. I don't do anything like that. So if I'm talking about a product, it's because I believe it and I use it and I love it, not because anybody's paying me anything. So with that in mind, David came up with the idea. This is all PVC. It even engraves a cool little uh, snake head on the top of it. It's all PVC and it is plug and play. Once you get it in, you plug this into a thermostat. Uh, there's a little rodent rave going on behind me right now. You can hear the mice squeaking. I'm sorry about that. Guys, um, but you plug this into a thermostat, right? And you set your temperature, and it's much safer, of course. It's required, so make sure you plug it into a thermostat. And it comes with a 16-quart tub with a perch, which David builds, and it comes with this. You also thought of everything to come with a little hook also with your baby to move your baby around. And it comes with everything you see here. And uh, the best thing about it is that from a baby up until, I'd say, a year old, guys, you can easily keep your animal, whether it's an emerald or a green tree python, in this enclosure. Um, David is going to make it in white and in black. As far as prices go, it is $150 for the entire setup, everything you see here. And David mentioned, I think it's roughly like $35 in that area to ship it. So total investment is about $185. But keep in mind, you're, it's an enclosure that's going to last you for an entire year. And... Um, I just think it makes such sense and it's super practical, and I love it. I'm glad somebody came up with the idea because it's definitely needed in the hobby. So, David Brahms, Specialty Enclosure Designs, I will put a link down below, and please go and check it out. Okay, so every time we make a video, there's randomly, I don't know, eight questions that always uh, you guys always uh, either comment on my video or you email me or hit me up on Instagram or Facebook. So I really wanted to cover them. Most of them deal specifically with green tree pythons, but for the first question, I thought I'd take out a green sanzini because it's definitely applicable. And that question is, Gary, uh, do you do wait lists for your animals? And if so, can I be on your wait list? I don't do wait lists for my animals, guys. The reason being that 
Um, the first is I think it's bad luck. I'm always afraid if I start a wait list for an animal. I know it's just paranoia on my part, but I feel like I'm, that's going to cement the fact that I'm not going to produce babies for that particular species that year. So that's the, that's the first reason. The second reason is specifically with like green tree pythons. I don't start wait lists because it's such a long process. By the time you hatch the babies and establish the baby, it could be many months. And what happens is I find myself in the past, I'd call up people and say, hey, you used to reach out to me all the time. You want to be on my wait list for green tree pythons. I know it's like five months later, but I have them available. And many times people's situations would change. Maybe they didn't have the financial means at that time. Maybe they got them from somebody else. But then I find myself just chasing people. And I just feel like kind of jerky reaching out to people and saying, hey, do you want my baby now after it's been five months? So for those reasons, I just really don't start wait list. Um, I, don't, I really don't have them until I actually hatch babies and I start establishing them. Then I would start taking a wait list. But up until that time, guys, that's really the reason I do not start a wait list. Can I keep two green tree pythons or two emerald tree boas in the same enclosure? Can I keep them together? I want to be really clear on this. Absolutely not. No. People say to me, but zoos do it. Yeah, well, zoos have huge enclosures, and it's still a nightmare when those, they're feeding their animals. But um, I want to be, like I said, really clear. You should, under no circumstance, keep two green tree pythons or two emerald tree boas together. Here's the reason why, guys. Their feeding responses are so strong that um, they can easily latch onto the same rodent. But more importantly, what happens is that even if they're in the same enclosure, you're feeding other animals in that room, their spidey senses are up. They're going to sense a rodent in that room. And at that moment, they're pretty much going to strike and grab and wrap anything that moves around them. And it happens to be their cage mate, the other emerald tree bow that you're keeping with it, or the other green tree python are being kept together. Um, it's going to be a world of problems. They have very big teeth. They could do some damage to their cage mates. And it's just, like I said, just prevent the uh, situation before it happens. So under no circumstances should you ever keep uh, two arboreal snakes together. Okay, you see that right there, guys? That is my probe that is right in front of my fan in my incubator. So the question is, Gary, where do I put my probe inside my incubator? Should I put it in my nest box? No, guys. You don't put it in your nest box. Your probe always goes right in front of your fan. And again, I know there are people who do things differently. I'm going to tell you guys what works for me. And in this case, I really do think it's the right way. Um, why do you put your probe in front of your fan as opposed to inside your, uh, your actual egg box? It's because... It is going to take longer for your incubator to achieve the temperatures you need them to be at if you put the probe inside the egg box. Uh, think about it, the whole surrounding area outside the egg box um, will come up to heat where you need it to be first. And then, because it's another layer of insulation inside the egg box, it's just going to take a little longer to uh, get the temperature that you need inside the egg box. And every time you open the egg box, uh, you're going to cause a fluctuation in that temperature. With many species, guys, it's not a big deal. If you're hatching Angolan pythons or carpet pythons, it's a larger egg, it's fine. With green tree python eggs, it's not that they're that much more difficult than any other egg, but as I mentioned in pri uh, previous videos, they're much smaller because they're much more, they're more sensitive. So the more steady you can keep the parameters of heat and humidity, the better off you're going to be. More fluctuation, you're just simply increasing your odds of something happening to your egg. So again, where should I put my probe inside my incubator? I put it right in front of my fan. It keeps a nice constant temperature, and it's nice. The air is constantly being circulated right in front of the probe, and uh, that's it. Okay, should you treat your newly acquired captive hatched baby green tree python for parasites? Short answer, absolutely not, no. Do not treat your baby captive hatched chondro for parasites. What is a captive hatched baby? Well, 90% of the baby green tree pythons you see available are captive hatched. That means they are hatched out over in Indonesia. Uh, they breed the adults or, or field collect the eggs, I guess. I'm not 100% sure on that. But in either case, these babies are hatched over in a farm in Indonesia. They tend to get them feeding. Uh, most of the time, they'll get them feeding on rodents, uh, pinky mice. And the ones I'm sure that are prob problematic, they probably offer small lizards to or small frogs. That's where the problems come into play. But for the most part, if you get a captive hatched baby green tree python, just assume it was never fed frogs or lizard, and uh, just get it on pinky mice like you would a captive bred board animal. In fact, if you're newer to green tree pythons or arboreals in general, you should never buy a, green, a baby green tree python captive hatch. That's not at least minimally three to six months old and, and well established. In the case of these, these are seven captive hatch babies, all hatched out in Indonesia. Quick story behind these is that they came into the importer here into the United States. The importer probably had them for a few days. From the importer, they went to the broker, the middleman, who, who kept them for about three days. And then I finally got them. So think about that. Within one week's time, they went from 
Uh, they were imported into the U.S. They came from a completely different continent. Uh, they went to the hands of an importer. They went to the hands of the middleman. They came to me, and the night I got them in, all seven of these babies fed, which was I was just amazed by that. But so, what can you do about as far as you know if you're concerned about parasites with your captive hatch baby? Well, here's what you do: just get them established, and then wait minimally until they're about a year old, and then you could do a fecal sample and take them to a vet. If you try to treat these animals under the age of, you know, especially under the age of six months, when they're probably well under the range of 60 grams, they're just too small to be treated with medications. They're too small to be brought to a vet. It's just going to stress the hell out of them. So when you get your captive hatch baby, just to be clear of what, uh, what I just said there, is that establish them, keep them feeding, and then when they reach about a year old, take them to a vet and get a fecal done. At that point, if they test positive for anything and doing the fecal test, then you could treat them. The vet will help you with that. Then you could treat them. And you could treat them knowing that they're a well-established animal with a nice size as opposed to being a tiny little baby, which you will do more damage than good. So, um, again, if there's no issues with them at all, I don't even think you need to bring them to a vet. With her. I have animals down here that are, I have a female that's 19 years old. She was a captive hatch baby over at Indonesia. I never did a single thing with her. So uh, I don't touch any of my babies. I think the less you mess with them, the better. Unless you're seeing an actual problem, I wouldn't do anything. Uh, but if you're really set on, you want to make sure the animals are clean, then wait minimally till the year before you get a fecal done. Because even if they did find parasites, you wouldn't want to treat them till they were at least a year old. Okay, how old does my green tree python need to be in order to breed her? Well, guys, it has very little to do with age. I mean, age definitely plays uh, a part in it, but it really has more to do with size. And you can't really pump the hell out of these animals either. So don't think you're going to get them really big and fat to where they need to be in a couple of years and breed them. That's not going to work either. So to give you specific numbers, I would never breed a green tree python female unless she was minimally 650 grams. Um, and typically, I wouldn't, you know, minimally... I would say four years old. Can you breed them at three years old if they hit 650 grams? You can, but all you're going to wind up doing is typically getting a smaller clutch of eggs from that animal. I'd personally rather wait an additional year, get more size on her, and theoretically get a bigger clutch. But again, has not, you know, there's some animals that just grow slower than others also. I mean, I've seen chondros that are five years old females that are coming up on 500, gra you know, 500 grams just because they're a smaller stature animal. Um, some of the Kofi owl animals, the Canary Island animals, tend to be, you know, smaller in size to begin with, so they might take a little bit longer to get up to size. But again, uh, this girl, she's actually seven years old now. She gave me two clutches in a row the last couple of years. But she was 650 grams when I bred her for the first time. She was four years old. And I think those are great numbers to work with. Um, if you read the old Complete Chondro, the Greg Maxwell book, he used to talk about females being 1,000 grams before we bred them. Well, that's simply not true anymore. And we know that 1,000 grams for these animals is just, it's actually too big for them. In the wild, you'd be hard-pressed to find a green tree python that was ever even close to 1,000 grams. Um, there's been research done. I think they were finding uh, females that had produced at about 400 grams in the wild, 450 grams. Um, but in captivity, 650 grams, I'd say ideally four years old would be the perfect age and the perfect size when to breed your female green tree pythons. What is the difference between a yellow green tree python baby and a red green tree python baby? Super common question. I know for the newer folks out there, newer keepers, it's really confusing, especially given the price differences. Short answer, guys, red neonates turn, tend to turn out much nicer, uh, much prettier than the yellow neonates. Now, what do I mean by nicer? Well, let's talk about specifically designer animals. If you're buying animals that are, let's say you bought babies from a high blue pairing, the, the phenotype, the appearance of the animals, the adults, are really high blue. Um, theoretically or traditionally, uh, the red hatchlings are going to be a much, much closer resemblance of the parents uh, than the yellow neonate will. We know through generations of breeding designer animals, especially in the case of high blue animals, that the red neonates turn to, tend to turn out much more blue than a yellow neonate would. Uh, in the case of designers, either this, this is a yellow manaquari baby, that's a red manaquari baby. And I can tell you from breeding them for many, many years, the red neonates are going to turn out to be resemble of the, the phenotype of the parents better than the yellow uh, neonates. Well, that means that they're going to look more like the parents. And typically when you buy baby green tree pythons from a breeder, you want them because you want the, your babies that you picked out to look like uh, the parents that you uh, obviously you like. That's why you, you took babies from those clutches. Um, it can be a little bit confusing, guys, because in some situations, like with locality types, Aru, let's talk about Aru babies, Aru Island babies. Let's talk about uh, Kofiao Island babies, or better known as... Um, uh, canary chondros. They're only hatched out as yellow babies, so you don't have the option of red versus yellow. But again, whether you're talking about designers or whether you're talking about locality babies, 
the reality is that the red babies tend to turn out just much nicer and again carry the phenotype of, of, of the parents that you purchase from. Uh, that also explains the differential, uh, differential in price, right? In most cases, like a baby yellow Manaquari baby would typically sell for, you know, captive bred and born baby, you're talking about $1,250. Where a red baby, you're going to wind up paying somewhere in the area of about three thousand dollars for. So you can see it's a, it's a, uh, a big price differential there. And uh, you can always pay attention too. You notice what, when breeders have holdbacks, uh, they always tend to hold back the red babies because we know from breeding these animals for so many years that the red babies are going to just turn out nicer. So I hope that answered that question. What's the difference between red and yellow babies? Well, the red babies uh, just tend to turn out much prettier. <music> I see this question a lot, especially during the breeding season, and that is, why won't my male breed? I see it all the time, right? You put a male in the cage with a female, and they're on separate sides of the cage, and nothing happening, and it's super frustrating. So we're going to talk about green tree pythons, but really this could, uh, could be talking about any python species here. Why won't my male breed? Well, in this case, this animal is an 18-month-old uh, male green tree python. At 18 months, uh, most, I, I believe all male pythons are producing viable sperm. That means they're, they're quite capable of uh, impregnating a female, making a female grab it, right? So at 18 months, we know they're producing viable sperm. That does not mean they're going to be great breeders. They're still young animals. They still just, you know, in my personal experience, the more mature males, the older males, simply make better breeders. Um, but again, you can breed, especially with ball pythons. You guys know out there who work with ball pythons. I mean, you guys are probably breeding them easily at 18 months, the males. But that's not the case in all species. So that's the first thing we're going to talk about. If, just because your male is old enough to breed doesn't mean he's going to make a good breeder. So keep that in mind. The second thing is, you know, not all pairs are compatible. I mean, it's possible. I mean, I was thinking about Rico Walder, many years ago, green tree pythons had an albino uh, male green tree python. His name was, I believe, Midas, who was on loan from Trooper Walsh. That male, for Rico, as talented as he was with these animals, that male would just not breed. So sometimes just incompatibility, that could also be part of the problem. But what I'm going to tell you to do is don't focus as much on your male. I mean, that would make sense, right? The male's not doing what he's supposed to do. We focus on the males. When we actually, I think what we should do is focus on the females. And your job as a breeder is to get your female to start producing follicles. Because once your female starts producing follicles, I'm telling you, I've had males that were not great breeders, and as soon as that female's producing, that male is all over her. And again, that's not just with green tree pythons. I've had that a lot with sabu pythons. I've had it with carpet pythons. You know, these, obviously, the males can sense the females are building follicles, and they start just locking up with them all the time. So how do you get your female to start producing follicles? Well, that's where cycling comes in, right, guys? I mean, we talk about it all the time. Do you have to cycle your animals? No, you do not have to. Some people don't cycle their animals. They're really lucky, and they'll get pairs to breed. Uh, that does not happen all the time, though. In fact, it happens happens probably less often than it does happen. Um, so what do we say cycle your animal? We're going to start by light cycling. Okay, you're going to light cycle your animal. You're going to temperature cycle your animal. And I get into that in previous videos. I'll put a link down below. And then on top of that, you're going to food cycle your females. Okay, so between uh, temperature, between light, and between food, all these three items, all these three factors are going to act as a catalyst to get your female to start producing follicles. And if you can do that and you're successful in doing that, you're going to have much more luck with getting your males to breed. So again, when your male's not breeding, uh, it, could, it could be incompatibility issues. It could be maybe he's too young. But I am telling you, even with those things taken into consideration, if you can get your female to start uh, producing follicles by cycling her correctly and cycling her, cycling her at the correct times, uh, there's a very good chance your male who's basically sitting there doing nothing will suddenly spring into action and start breeding your female. This is an almost two-year-old Savu Python male, silver Savu Python male. I know a lot of you guys have never seen these animals. I was fortunate enough to produce this one a couple years ago. Produced a bunch of babies last year, but it's going through its onogenic color change. And you can see they're almost pink when they hatch out. It's more a silvery color now, and you can see the black speckling coming in. But I love these animals, and they pretty much disappear for the hobby, so I feel super fortunate to be working with them and I'm hopefully going to produce uh, a lot of these again this year. But that pretty much wraps up video number 35, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for all the positive comments on my last week's video, too, about the uh, simple ways to keep green tree pythons. You guys really responded to that, and I really hope I was able to help a lot of you out there. As always, support US ARC, and please don't forget to like and subscribe to my videos. I really appreciate it. But more importantly, please go like and subscribe to the US ARC on the US ARC YouTube channel. They really need our support. And make a donation if you can as well. Thanks for watching, and I will see you guys again in a couple weeks. Who has the best YouTube channel? Me?